Hello and welcome to another edition of District of Sports. I'm George Gerbo. A reminder that you can find all of our sports coverage here at the Washington Times at WashingtonTimes.com slash sports. And you can find the District of Sports wherever you get your podcasts, including on Apple, Google, Spotify, TuneIn, and more. Just search District of Sports in your favorite podcast app. After a 5-0 September had them riding a ton of momentum, October Maryland reared its ugly head again. After letting a 10-point lead slip away at Ohio State, the Terrapins dropped their homecoming contest against Illinois, and after a bye week, things didn't change, losing in embarrassing fashion at Northwestern, one of the worst programs in the Big Ten. Now at 5-3, and three, here comes November, a month that head coach Mike Loxley is only 3-11 and 11 in since coming back to Maryland in 2019. It starts with a rivalry that's not really a rivalry, as Maryland hosts number 9, Penn State. As the Big Ten expands and divisions are eliminated, the Nittany Lions and Terrapins won't play every season like they have when Maryland entered the conference in 2014. They will play next year, but it will be more sporadic following that. The two neighboring state schools first played in 1917, but this rivalry is one of the most lopsided in college football. Penn State has won 42 of 46 meetings with the Terps with one tie. Off of a Rose Bowl win last season, the Nittany Lions had even higher college football playoff expectations for 2023, but those hit a bit of a speed bump in a 20-12 loss to Ohio State on October 21st. Maryland also had greater expectations after back-to-back bowl wins, but their three-game losing streak now has the Terps scrambling to find a sixth win for bowl eligibility amid a tough November slate. And so joining me to break down the Nittany Lions and the Terps, Penn State and Maryland, this weekend in College Park is Joe Smeltzer from Nittany Sports Now, who will also be there Saturday uh, covering the game. Joe, good to see you again. Hope things are well. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me, George. I hope everything's going well with you, and I'll be seeing you in person Saturday, so looking forward to that. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, This Penn State team came into this season with, uh, you know, of course, a lot of expectations, uh, admittedly, uh, I myself, they were my preseason pick to to win the the conference. Looking at an Ohio State team that had a new quarterback and a Michigan team that was trying to go for three straight conference championships, and they're still trying to do so. Uh, and of course, you know the Nittany Lions lost two weeks ago in Columbus, um, and and come back uh, against Indiana last week, uh, and eventually pull away at the end there for the victory. Just, well, your sense of what the the state of, of the Penn State is right now? Uh, after this Indiana game, they've not, you know, the knock on Michigan is that they are putting up crazy numbers and they're beating everybody by a lot, but they haven't played anybody. Ohio State has wins over Notre Dame and Penn State, of course, but they're not particularly explosive uh, as Ohio State teams of the past. And then Penn State is kind of here where their only loss is Ohio State. But in some ways, Joe, it seems like they've not been maybe as impressive as fans and people would like them to have been. Yeah, George, I think that's a fair assessment. Uh, I've been saying this for well over a year. It's really hard for how the way how the Big Ten is now, how Penn State schedules its out of conference games, which that was a big topic a few weeks ago. It's hard for Penn State to impress people because you're either playing an average to bad team or you're playing a national championship contender every single week. You have Ohio State and Michigan. And then Penn State is just much better than anybody else they're going to play. West Virginia is decent. Iowa, I was decent. Uh, but you got your teams like Illinois is not good. Northwestern isn't. Um, Indiana definitely isn't. It looked like Maryland uh, might be uh, pretty solid. But the way Maryland's played over the past month, I don't think Penn State's going to turn any skeptics into believers uh, by whatever they do in College Park Saturday. So the schedule puts Penn State in a very tough spot. And yeah, there aren't very many games where you look at what Penn State did. You're not going to impress anybody by beating Delaware by 56 or UMass by 63. Uh, West Virginia, I don't think much of a statement was made. They're the closest thing they've probably made to making a statement this season was that shutout of Iowa. But again, a naysayer can look at that and say, well, Iowa's offense is a national punchline and Penn State's a defensive school traditionally. Like, what's the big deal there? So the way the schedule is, it's really hard for Penn State to impress when they're not playing 
college football is elite and the Big Ten's elite, and they've had one chance um, to beat a squad like that this season. And to be blunt, Penn State whiffed on that chance in Columbus two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And in kind of watching your coverage from afar and watching this team, you know, from afar, uh, the expectations, of course, uh, are are high in Happy Valley, and and rightfully so. It's still it is still jarring to me to you know look at a program that has won three New Year's Six bowl games, including last year's Rose Bowl, three New Year's Six bowl games over the last um, five seasons now. Fiesta Bowl win uh, in seventeen, a Cotton Bowl win, uh, and then the the Rose Bowl last year over Utah, and you know, it's it's hard for me to look at that and and understand criticism that they should be better. But I understand the expectations Penn State fans have because a lot of people would take those results I just laid out to you, and that'd be like a you know a wonderful time for their program. But in in Happy Valley and in, in State College, there the expectations, of course, are higher when you have the, the caliber uh, of talent that that Franklin gets uh, and recruits there. Um, and you mentioned the Ohio State game is is the critic is that criticism warranted? I mean, he's I think it's one or one and eight or one and nine now against the Buckeyes. Uh, it, it's it, you look and you thought, okay, maybe this is Penn State's year and the game's on the road and everything, and and you know, grind it out, classic Big Ten ish looking game. But Penn State was, I believe, one of sixteen on third down, so they struggled there, and that's probably where you can say that the the game was won and lost. Where if you can't convert on third down and extend drives, you know, you're not going to be in a position to score and Penn State struggled to do that so is some of that criticism warranted or do you think it's a little bit overblown about not winning uh the big game well it's hard to say it's not warranted uh when the record is right there you mentioned one and nine against Ohio State three and six against Michigan the record against Michigan State has improved over the past few years but overall I think they're around 500 against Michigan State um, that's not too good. And I think when you're a coach, uh, and I don't knock James Franklin for doing this because you're supposed to do this as the face of a program when you're saying, oh, well, we're, we're tired of being great. We want to be elite. We want to be the best, which is what he said five years ago. People are going to hold you to that. And I think James Franklin holds himself to that. And when that expectation is not met, people are going to notice, and especially this year, talking about that Ohio State game, that was such a winnable game. When you have a five-star quarterback, granted a young quarterback in Drew Aller, you have an offensive-minded head coach in James Franklin and a supposed guru in Mike Yurcich, who is always, all of a sudden has, I don't want to say he's a villain, but he's been getting a lot of flack from Penn State fans since that Ohio State game. And, for, and really, going back before that, Penn State's offense has been um, – kind of called a vanilla, dull, boring, uh, really all season. And that's mm. been magnified ever since the team lost its first game. So, uh, yeah, the overall record is obvious. What Franklin has said about needing the university, the fans, everybody to buy in to get this program to the next level, wanting to be elite, that's well documented too. And the game was right there. It would have been one thing if we just kind of found out that Ohio State is way better than what we expected because Ohio State, kind of like Penn State, really didn't get a chance to prove much of anything um, until that Penn State game. Yeah, the win against Notre Dame on the road was impressive, but kind of the way that game unfolded, I think a lot of people felt that Notre Dame lost that game more than Ohio State won it. And Ryan Day didn't help himself by complaining about an 86 year old man in his post game <laughs> interview, but that that's another discussion. But <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think uh, James Franklin is obviously a good coach. Um, anybody who wants to move on from James Franklin, um, to be blunt, doesn't really know what they're talking about, I don't think. But at the same time, there's nothing wrong uh, with criticism and there's nothing wrong from wanting more, especially since the program definitely holds itself to a higher standard than just winning double-digit games and going to a New Year's Six Bowl every year, which mm-hmm. by and large Penn State has done since 2016. Yeah. This, uh, as the Nittany Lions enter this week against Maryland, uh, they get a Maryland team that uh, is at its, obviously it's low point of the season and arguably the, the lowest uh, point of Mike Loxley's tenure uh, after, uh, in his fifth year now, uh, 0-3 in the month of October, losing two games, uh, two easily winnable games on homecoming against Illinois and at Northwestern, both when Maryland was favored by two scores in each of those games. Uh, and so now after winning all your games in September, you've lost all of them in October. And so now we move to November. 
uh, and the Nittany Lions come to town. And Maryland has struggled uh, historically against them decisively. For They've played 42 times. Maryland's only won three of them since uh, the series started back in the 1940s. And two of them, ironically, coming since they've both been members of the Big Ten. Uh, but before that, only once did Maryland win, and there's a tie in there somewhere. Uh, Maryland fans would like to think of this as... Uh, I, don't, I hate using because Loxley doesn't use the term rivals and arguably Maryland doesn't have any rivals in this conference right now. But Maryland fans like this game, like having this game against Penn State because it's a school that's close. And to be to be frank, uh, pun intended, I guess, with James Franklin, he takes a lot of players out of this region because he knows the region very well because he was on the staff here um, with Ralph Friedgen back in the in the Terp staff with Loxley back in the early 2000s. So I think there's some animosity from Maryland fans and, and whatnot. Uh, based on that. Uh, so as much as Maryland fans would like this to, to be a rivalry, which it has not been competitively, I'm curious what the view of the Penn State program or Penn, you know, the fans and, and supporters of the Nittany Lions think about this game at Maryland. Is it something that uh, is, is more of an afterthought in the, in the long run when you've got to play games against Michigan and Ohio State every year? And those are your games that matter and obviously not the one against the Terps. That's an interesting question, George. And I think if you ask pretty much any Penn State fan, they'll tell you, well, no, uh, Maryland, excuse me, is not a rivalry game. They would cite the data that you just gave of the series history. But it's at the point where Penn State fans are so annoyed with how much Maryland fans hate Penn State <laughs> that it's almost <laughs> they almost consider it a rivalry kind of subconsciously. So I like that. I like um, that. Yeah. And it's. Penn State fans don't get up for a Maryland game the way they would Ohio State or Michigan. Obviously not. But I think it definitely, uh, they pay a little closer attention to this game than they would a game like Indiana, for sure. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely more of kind of a one-sided type of deal with uh, Maryland. It's the biggest home game they'll play um, all season. Well, maybe, is, is Michigan coming to Maryland? I think they are. Yeah, Michigan's coming to College Park. Uh, the Maryland season may already be in doubt at that point if they lose this one. So this this is one you've got circled on the calendar and Maryland's going with, uh, they're bringing out gold jerseys. Script Terps is back. And so they're doing, they're donning gold jerseys for the first time. Uh, so they've, they've placed a, you know, kind of a, a little showcase to, for lack of a better term on this one. Right. And uh, yeah, it definitely means more to Maryland than it does to Penn State. I think arguably both players and fans um, but at the same time, I definitely feel that Penn State fans think enough about Maryland to where, I don't know if you could call it a rivalry, but you could call it a little bigger deal than most Big Ten games are mm -hmm. for, on Penn State's end. Speaking of, of rivalries, as you know, as the conference moves forward, this is this was set to be the last time the teams regularly played since Maryland joined the conference as members of the Big Ten East as the Big Ten adds more teams and they dispense with the division model. Um, however, after adding Oregon and Washington, they rearranged it. So Penn State and Maryland will actually play once again next year. Uh, and then it'll be a little more intermittent after that. But but in this new new model, Joe, uh, the, the Nittany Lions don't have any of these, what the conference is calling protected rivals. Uh, Maryland's got Rutgers on there. So they're going to play Rutgers every year into the future home, uh, you know, alternating home and road, of course, Ohio state and, and, and Michigan are going to play Michigan and Michigan state. And so there's this little game speckled across the conference, but Penn state doesn't have any of those. And I know the program likes to use the tag unrivaled, but I'm actually curious whether uh, the Penn state's kind of myth, like, Hey, we don't get to play the Buckeyes every year. We don't get to play, you know, Michigan every year. Is, is there some, They'll still play them, but more sporadically than on an annual basis. Is that something that that sits well with with the program? Um, I don't know if I can speak for the program, but I will say to any Penn State fan that's happy about going two years without playing Michigan, and I'll, I'll say this for Michigan fans too, I just don't really understand that viewpoint uh, because no, M Penn State Michigan is definitely not. Um, Ohio State, Michigan, Auburn, Alabama, not at that level at all, but it's still a matchup that I think college football fans see every year. And this year's a great example would be a better example if Penn State had beaten Ohio State. And if that had happened, I think this would be arguably the biggest college football game of the season, but it didn't. And nonetheless, Penn State still a top, uh, assuming, um, it beats Maryland, uh, 
Saturday, which it's supposed to. It'll come in as a top 10, probably top eight team uh, going against Michigan, who Michigan's going to pound Purdue, and they'll still be probably at number two because I don't think Georgia's going anywhere. But that that's still going to be a big game. And um, I think Penn State fans would definitely rather play Michigan than UCLA. Uh, I think Michigan fans would rather play Penn State than UCLA. It's definitely, I don't know what uh, James Franklin's uh, viewpoint is on it, uh, whatever his viewpoint is. He's probably not going to say publicly, um, but um, at the same time, from speaking from the fans end, because I think I could speak to that a little more, uh, kind of seeing what Penn State fans, their unfiltered opinions on social media. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely think something is lost by not having – the matchups that we've grown so used to every season. And I, I don't think Penn State fans are too happy with being the only Big Ten school that doesn't have a protected rivalry game. Yeah, Iowa, Iowa got away with three of them, which is the most. And uh, Penn State uh, is the only team in the conference that doesn't have any, which is yeah, kind of strange, especially considering the history uh, of the program. Uh, I'll get you out of here on, on this one. And it's kind of, I mentioned earlier about James Franklin and Mike Loxley. Um, you know, on the they were on the same staff uh, here at Maryland with Ralph Friedgen. Um, they, there's some similarities in them in terms of, you know, we, we, we talked about James Franklin in terms of big games. Mike Loxley has the same issue. He has one win combined against, we'll call them the big three, Ohio state, Penn state, and Michigan since, since he has started at Maryland in 2019. Um, they've got, they've got, so they're similar in, in, in that regard. Um, at one point I get the assumption that they were, were kind of, you know, closer and, and being on the same staff like that. And then it's talked about that Franklin was in line to take the Maryland job after Friedgen retired, but Friedgen stuck around Franklin, then left to Vanderbilt. And of course, then he ends up at Penn state Mer after Franklin leaves Maryland ends up firing Friedgen anyway, and brings in Randy Etzel. And it kind of starts the program down this path of, you know, out in the wilderness for a little bit. Uh, I'm curious, does he, does Franklin ever talk about his, his time uh, in, in college park when he was one of, you know, very highly regarded coordinator, which obviously led to him getting the head coaching job at Vanderbilt. And then he, led Vanderbilt to some of their most successful seasons in their program's history before coming to Penn State. Um, does he ever talk about his his time in in College Park and, and on that staff with Ralph Friedgen? Of course, Loxley reflects on it a lot because Maryland this year has done some things that they haven't done uh, historically since the Friedgen years in terms of offense. And I'm curious if, if Franklin ever, you know, falls back on some, especially this week playing Maryland, does he ever recall some of those memories in talking about Friedgen and his time in College Park? He definitely talks about it. Uh, he might get asked about it tomorrow. I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, he he he'll sometimes use the opening statement. Uh, he'll be always and his, James's opening statement is uh, pretty well organized every single week. He'll talk about the other team, the other coaches, um, and when he talks about Maryland, he's going to mention his history there. And most of the Penn State beat uh, kind of knows the deal by this point, so I don't know how deep he'll go into it. Uh, but yeah, when whenever he talks about it, I notice he kind of. Says what he'd expect. Um, I think he sees uh, Coach Friedgen as a mentor uh, for him. Um, I don't know how he feels about the way his time uh, ended at Maryland, but I definitely uh, feel that he's appreciative um, overall of everything that happened until that point. So, yeah, he, he might talk about it in the opening statement. Uh, he might get asked about it, uh, but um, it's something that uh, I would see. He has Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, I think he'll address it at some point, and when he does, he'll probably – Say uh, nothing too crazy, but uh, the expected stuff about how he came to Maryland as a young coach, uh, worked there for nine years, and that kind of set him on the path he is now. So, yeah, I think he'll be complimentary overall to his time there and definitely complimentary of Mike Loxley, which he is with every opposing coach, but especially since these two had the pre-existing relationship before they both became head coaches. Give me, uh, uh, finally, give me one key if, if Maryland were to win this game, uh, what is one thing that they need to do well? I think I would predict Penn State wins. I don't know the margin because uh, kind of like you, we've talked about uh, the Penn State offense has been interesting, but Maryland's defense got Northwestern's one of the worst scoring teams in the country, 20 points a game. And, and they, they torched Maryland for 30 plus last week in a secondary that was at full strength but has been dealing with some injuries on the Maryland side. So I'm worried about their ability. And I know Penn State hasn't thrown the – or fans have not liked the uh, Penn State uh, not throwing the ball as much as they would. Um, but I think Maryland's going to struggle to stop uh, Catron Allen and um, Nick Singleton. Uh, Singleton. So 
Uh, I'm, I'm curious what the, the if there's one thing that Maryland needs if Maryland is to win this game, what do they need to do in terms of of neutralizing something Penn State does well? Yeah, George, uh, Chop Robinson is hurt, uh, so he's in doubt for uh, what would have been his return uh, to Maryland, which would be a shame. But um, I'm still going to say that uh, the key, at least from the offensive end for Maryland, will be to uh, protect Tonga Vailoa and protect the football. I think even without Chop, Penn State's defensive group of defensive ends is arguably the deepest group on this team. Uh, Denied Dennis Sutton is a Maryland guy uh, from Maryland, um, five-star recruit. He's really kind of blossoming in that sophomore year, kind of taking the next step that Franklin, uh, Penn State's coaches and fans wanted him to. Adisa Isaac uh, is a veteran guy. Uh, he's very good. And then uh, there's two guys uh, that are going to get, I think, an extended look uh, if Chop is out. Um, Amin Vanover and Zariah Fisher, those are two that are four and five on Penn State's normal defensive end rotations, but they would be starting um, at a lot of places. Uh, so Penn State's group uh, is very good um, on the ends. I haven't watch, been able to watch too much of Maryland this year, uh, but from what I've seen of the offensive line, uh, there's – there could be some work done there. I watched the Ohio State game, and definitely last year, uh, Tongue of Iloa didn't have a chance. They were just yeah. uh, living in that backfield, uh, winning, uh, ended up winning, obviously, 30 to nothing, and it could have been a lot worse. Um, but I don't know if we're going to see a repeat of that, but I would definitely feel that if Maryland's offensive line can kind of neutralize Penn State's defensive ends, I think Tongue of Iloa has been – has tended to turn the ball over, and this is a Penn State defense under Manny Diaz that loves to cause havoc and force those turnovers. So that's something Penn State does well. And if Tonga Vailoa can kind of avoid that, not throw any picks, take care of the ball, and the offensive line can take care of him, um, maybe Maryland could get something done uh, offensively. But like you, uh, I would definitely predict uh, Penn State uh, to win this football game. And I think I don't think Ivor Russell saying anything crazy by predicting that so <laughs> as you've as you've laid it out a tall task uh for the terps on saturday uh joe smeltzer from nittany sports now let uh let uh, the folks know where they can find uh, your coverage and on social media sure uh starting with social media our account is uh nittany sports now then at nittany sn my personal account is at joe smeltzer 775 and the site's name is nittany sports now uh just type in nittany sports now and we also have a facebook account uh, that is the site's name so uh those are uh, the best ways uh, to see what we do and also uh, we are on instagram doing a lot hmm. more kind of graphic design uh work which i can take zero credit for there, <laughs> <laughs> there's other people working on that joe smeltzer from nittany sports now joe i appreciate it and i'll see you saturday absolutely looking forward to it thanks for having me on My thanks to Joe for joining me. You can find his work for Nittany Sports Now at nittanysportsnow.com. Kickoff between the Terps and Nittany Lions is set for 3.30 p.m. on November 4th. Penn State is a 10-point favorite. A reminder, you can find my work covering the Terps as well at Gerbo3 on social media and at washingtontimes.com slash sports, where you can find all of our sports coverage and find the District of Sports wherever you get your podcasts on every major podcast platform. Just search District of Sports in your favorite podcast app. I'm George Gerbo. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.